You might have heard of the phrase that says, worth your weight in salt. This is an idiom that means someone or something is valuable or deserves respect. The phrase is thought to have originated in ancient Rome, where soldiers were sometimes paid in salt or given an allowance to go and buy salt. The word salarium comes from the Latin word sal, which means salt. And the English word that comes out of this is salary. Before salt deposits were readily available around the world, merchants would travel long distances to go sell salt to villages. And salt is mentioned 40 times in Scripture. Matthew's Gospel says, you are the salt of the earth. For salt was required in ancient Hebrew religious sacrifices, as it's illustrated in both Leviticus and Ezekiel. And in Jesus' own time, salt was a valuable preservative that would be rubbed on meats to slow the rotting process. In Numbers, we hear of an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord to you and to your descendants who will follow after you. While Colossians says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. You see, salt symbolizes a long-lasting friendship and relationship between people. It's also a symbol of God's everlasting love for us. The salt points to our stewardship, that is, our connection to one another. And if salt is also seen as grace, we understand that grace is something that we cannot own, for grace is from the goodness of God, yet grace is something we can strive to grasp, to have in our lives. This is why Mark's gospel today says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. In the reading today, Jesus' disciples have fallen into this trap where they're trying to create a class system based around a relationship with Jesus. They start complaining that others have been casting out demons in your name. And so Jesus begins to teach. He instructs them about our life and our identity in any potential millstone that is placed around our necks. For those millstones are obstacles, obstacles that get in our way of living into a full relationship with God and therefore a full relationship with each other. And whenever there is a separation from relationships, it points to the activity of sin in the world. But as we know, life can be hard at times. And in the hardness of life, we still have to look in the hope that there is joy to come. When an obstacle or a millstone has been released, that we can start to see the salt coming back into our lives, that is, God's grace being present. We might ask ourselves these questions that we hear in the letter to James today. Are any among you suffering? Are any among you cheerful? Are any among you sick? Real questions about joys and sorrows. And a reminder that for us as a church, we are a place of both celebrations and of healing, but all in the name of Jesus so that discipleship can permeate out into the world. Now for me, I see the word salt as being translated as trials. Some trials are hard, some trials are good, but if our trials have lost their sense of constant celebration and healing, then how can we feed the love of Jesus to others as well as to receive it ourselves? This is why Jesus says, 
Have salt in yourself and be at peace with each other. Now, as I shared in our parish forum today, I'll share with you that if you ever want to participate in a fascinating activity, I encourage you to find a concordance, which is a book that tells you every word that's found in the Bible and where to find it in the Bible. And then you can count how many times that word comes up in Scripture. So if you're like me and you're a fan of Ted Lasso, the word believe is 273 times. Pray, 371 times. Love, 714 times. But the word give, 2,172 times in Scripture. These four words, believe, pray, love, give, becomes part of our necessary equipment as we try to grow in our faith. For anything important in our lives should cause us a time to pause so that we can look and see the connections that this moment, this trial, is bringing us in relationship with God and with each other. Knowing that God's love always grows when we put God first and we put others before ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been to a funeral or a graduation when people sit around and hark about the cost of the casket or cap and gown. Instead, they live into the celebration of a life well lived, they live into the celebration of one's accomplishments. And it shows in that celebration this maturing through the millstones that might have gotten in the way. It also helps us to embrace the joyfulness, especially after overcoming any challenges or obstacles in our own spiritual maturity through believing and praying and loving and giving. It helps us to move away from this sense of allowing things like money to control our lives and just seeing it as another gift from God entrusted to us to share in God's kingdom. All of this still takes us back to our baptisms, our spiritual beginning, when we or someone spoke on our behalf promise to raise us in a faith so that we too can have these gifts, these equipments of growing together through prayer, through love, through belief, and through giving. A Christian writer said that the goal of stewardship is a faithful management of all that God gives us so that we can use our gifts to transform not only us spiritually, but also to reach out to others in the name of Jesus' transforming love. Now this week, many of you will receive your 2025 pledge card in the mail, and I ask you to think about this. When you receive it, to just simply hold it into your hands and to think about how you're going to make that salt statement of faith to pause and to offer a prayer to God that you believe in Jesus and that you believe that grace and Holy Trinity is the best place for you and your family to continue to mature in the love of Jesus. And then write your name on it and sign it. Now, you might have noticed that I said that it is the best place to grow, not a perfect place to grow. For the right community to help you do God's work, this is where God has planted us. And then when you're ready, you think about that monetary number, you write it down and return it to church, and you think about the ways that when those pledges come in, it is a celebration with everyone else who has chosen to do the same thing. They've chosen this to continue to be their place where they will serve the Lord and learn how to love each other better. But friends, we know this. God does not need our money.
but that God knows how we share all of our gifts, money included, reflects our spiritual well-being. And because we need God and those relationships which draw us closer to God, we should joyfully pledge to the place where we are learning and growing in God's knowledge and love. Knowing that the pledge is between you and God, but that it marks this salt contribution to a community where we can celebrate with our brothers and sisters who have also committed with us. So together, all of us can follow the same Savior in Jesus who we believe teaches us to pray, to love, and to give back 2,172 times of ourselves to God who has given us so much, and for that we have so much to be thankful for. Amen.